Uh, our last session today before our panel discussion is uh, Pastor Nate Newell, and uh, he's with Turning Point Church in Murfreesboro. He and I uh, both studied Hebrew poetry many years ago at Southeastern. I know you use it all the time, and you sing your, <laughs> sing your sermons from the Song of Solomon and the original Hebrew on Sunday mornings. Um, but as we moved into Middle Tennessee and started launching campuses in Middle Tennessee, Nate's been uh, one of those uh, key friends of ours, and he's on our, on our board now and just been a, a great supporter and uh, also is where our Murfreesboro campus is now being housed out of with Brother Gene and uh, just has Teen Challenge so cl close to his heart. And I'll tell you one thing that I, if you're around Nate, uh, you, 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 his positive energy is just really in, infectious. So if you're down, just hang around him, and you and you feel like you can do anything. And and that's been a great encouragement to to me because there were a few moments as we started moving into Middle Tennessee that I would go home and say to my wife, "There's no way this is going to happen." And uh, and then I'd hang out with you, and I'd feel like, "Yeah, we can do about anything. Let's open four or five centers. We can do that." <laughs> so I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your friendship. Um, let me remind you, there's note cards. Sarah, hold up one of those note cards, if you will. Uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, would you write a, a question out? We're going to have a panel that's going to come up here with a lot of experience, and uh, I don't want to be the only one asking questions, so don't be shy. Uh, write down some questions and be prepared uh, directly after this at 2.15. And uh, you can just stand up where you are and read your questions. And I think Gail said she wants to answer the difficult ones. So if you have one that can stump somebody, uh, do that one first, and we'll have Gail uh, help out with that one. Uh, would you welcome uh, Pastor Nate Newell? Oh, yes, the yeah. famous What's up, everybody? What's up? After lunch, everybody okay? Everybody good? That was delicious. Uh, uh, really, we need a Lenny's in Murfreesboro. We, we got pretty much everything else, don't we, Gene? Uh, praise God for that, that growth that has happened, but we need a Lenny's because that was good. Um, uh, just uh, just want to start by saying I'm just so thankful to Jonathan and uh, his, his friendship, and he alluded to some of that uh, and how far back we go. Uh, in fact, we, uh, we reconnected years after we graduated. We were at Southeastern together from 97 to 01, shared classes together, and, uh, and then parted ways after that and had no idea where each other landed, as, as, as many of our friends in college happened that way. And uh, we were attending a district council here, and they were giving tours of, of the Memphis Teen Challenge Center. And so uh, I came over with a few other pastors and got reconnected with, with, with John. I was like, dude, did you go to Southeastern? He's like, yeah. It's like, did we have classes together? Poetry. Hebrew poetry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're not teaching on Song of Solomon at all today, okay? We're, we're avoiding that. Um, but uh, just so thankful for how God has used this mighty man of God. He is uh, uh, an inspiration and uh, of like heart and like mind. Many of you know that not all ministries are created equally, and not everybody takes the kind of path of believing God for the miraculous like this ministry does. And I just uh, I, I want to thank this, this family, the Teen Challenge family, for just uh, opening your your hearts and your arms to 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 myself and our and our our church, and uh, thank you to these mighty men of God and to the cellos that I am I saying that right? Okay, last night um, you hear the heart of ministry in in all of you, and I just uh, thank you so much for everything you've shared today and have uh, deposited into us. Uh, quick quick uh, poll, quick question. Uh, how many in this room are associated with with Teen Challenge? You're on staff, or you serve at a at, at, at one of the centers. Okay, how many are here to celebrate recovery? Anybody ce celebrate recovery? Um, any other pastors in the room? Hey, <laughs> what's up, man? Uh, <laughs> 
uh, the reason why I'm asking that is uh, is because uh, talking with John and getting uh, getting the heart of God around what's going to happen today. Uh, we're talking about the church and the role of the church uh, with those who are struggling with with addiction, and uh, I really believe that the Lord has given me some uh, some insight to how we can look at this. And um, and I just want to before we start, I know we've prayed some, but I d I'm one of those guys who believes we just can't pray enough. Uh, we'll we'll never pray too much. We'll never praise him too much. We will never we will never stand before him and be guilty of giving him too much praise. Just won't happen. And so uh, let's just ask the Holy Spirit to take over this session. Can we do that? Holy Spirit, we say it and we mean it. Take over this session. This is about you and what you want to do in our lives. And Father, we just submit ourselves to the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that our hearts and our ears, our minds are open. Lord, change our perspective, our thinking. Lord God, transform us from the inside out. Let the power of the Holy Spirit sweep through this room. Lord God, and change us all. Lord, we set ourselves up to be changed again. I want to be changed again, transformed again by your power. Lord, speak to us in a dynamic way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 John was saying we share this, the, the same alma mater, which is, which is, which is true. Uh, back then, it was not Southeastern University. It was Southeastern Bible College. When we went, it was Bible College, right, John? It was. Or Southeastern Bridal College, as it was nicknamed. Ring by spring or your money back, for, for those of you who are talking about marriage and how important that is. Uh, John and I both avoided that paradigm and, and did not find our wives at... at at, at school, and I'm, I'm thankful about that, and uh, uh, I have, uh, I'm blessed to have a, a beautiful, a beautiful wife. We've been married uh, 16 years, and uh, we have a 15-year-old son named Joshua, 13-year-old son named Elisha. Uh, we went all Old Testament, y'all. You'll see it. You'll see in a second. We've got a nine-year-old named Zion, a seven-year-old named Judah. They're all boys, and then a baby girl named Selah, who is one. And so uh, it's an adventure all the time, and we absolutely love it. And just in a matter of year, of a year, how everything has been turned completely upside down. You talked about that bottle. Brother A, that's our life right now. Sailor shows up, <laughs> life's upside down. It's totally different. And, uh, but we are, we are blessed. And, and uh, as John was, was saying, uh, I'm the lead pastor uh, at Turning Point Church in Murfreesboro. And uh, God has done some incredible things. Can I tell you, how do you know that you are created for freedom when the word free is in the middle of the city that you serve? You'll never look at it the same. You'll never look at it the same. Mer frees borough. And we've been declaring that. We've been making that, that prophetic declaration for the last several years. And before we even recognized it, living there for so many years, before we recognized it, uh, God started moving things and putting things in place. I'm so thankful to Gene uh, Garcia and his role and everything that he's doing doing there. He's a part of our church. He's not just doing his thing over there on the other side of the building. He's a part of our church family, and it's just, what a testimony of God. I'm hearing the testimonies this morning. When you start putting the pieces together, men and women of God, God went to a lot of trouble to get you to where you're at. He went to a lot of trouble. He put a lot of pieces together. He, he moved other people into your life, put a program in your life, put, put circumstances in your life to get you to this point. My goodness, and the best is yet to come. I believe that with all of my heart. Uh, if you're going to believe, why don't you believe for the best? If you're going to believe, if you're going to go to all the trouble to believe, let's believe for the best and believe God to do something absolutely incredible. I believe he's going to do it today. Um, uh, again, we've been in Murfreesboro, uh, Turning Point. Uh, when we graduated college, uh, I took a, a, a position with a man of God, uh, who became a, a spiritual father to me. I didn't know at the time that was what was going to happen. Uh, he was an evangelist, he and his family, and so we, we traveled uh, the country uh, doing revival services, and we were planted in Murfreesboro. We were, we were stationed out of Murfreesboro. Uh, what everyone and their dog is figuring out right now, uh, even Google and Amazon, is that Middle Tennessee is with a 10-hour driving distance, one-day driving distance, of the entire population, 75% of the population in the U.S. is within a one day's drive. 
So Amazon has set up a few places in, in Middle Tennessee. And how many of y'all are seeing, it doesn't matter, from Memphis all the way to Knoxville, it's, uh, Tennessee is, is, is growing like crazy. But uh, uh, from 2003, we planted the church. Uh, my wife and I have been in that church and have served that man of God uh, for, uh, for the length of our ministry. We were youth pastors for nine years. Hallelujah. Any, any other recovering youth pastors in here? Let's talk about recovery. Any other recovering youth pastors in the room? Oh, my goodness. I tell, I tell our church that all the time. Hey, I'm a recovering youth, youth pastor, so if you, if you hear something that's off the wall, just blame it on that. Um, but we served uh, as youth pastors for nine years, uh, as assistant for three and a half, and then our, our founding pastor, our spiritual father, he, he retired, which didn't really retire. He became pastor emeritus and uh, continues to serve uh, in the church, and we became lead pastors, and uh, we absolutely love uh, the place that we serve, and we love being pastors. Uh, just hearing the, the passion that uh, I've heard since dinner last night throughout today, uh, I echo those same sentiments. When you know exactly what God has called you to do, and we didn't know that at the beginning. This has been a discovery along the way, but over and over, God continues to confirm, yes, this is what I've designed you for. This is what I've created you for. And uh, it's just, it's, it's absolutely been uh, the greatest joy of our life. Uh, we're thankful for all the connections that have been, that have been made, uh, and especially with, with Teen Challenge. Um, my first, my first uh, encounter with Teen Challenge, uh, and that's the only recovery program that I had ever known or ever heard of, was, was Teen Challenge is when we lived in Pennsylvania and a Teen Challenge group from New York came and ministered to our church. Uh, they ministered to us. I, I will always be impacted and will always remember those men, that choir. They, I mean, they had a full-on choir. They had a full-on band, everything. They shared, they shared their, their testimonies. I mean, it's like missionaries coming to the church completely completely wrecked my life in a good way okay that's that's youth talk for today wreck is a good thing all right so um it was it, it was so powerful and such such an impact and my father loved the ministry of david wilkerson and of teen challenge and i know many of you uh uh carry that same heart um and from the outside Looking in from a church standpoint and a pastoral standpoint, Teen Challenge, uh, I'm, I'm doubling down on everything that has been said. Teen Challenge, stay spiritually focused. Stay in the Word of God and stay in that submitted place that caused a man like David Wilkerson to be raised up by God to do something absolutely miraculous, something supernatural, something that goes beyond us uh, and our abilities. And so... Um, so I'm thrilled and, and absolutely honored to, uh, uh, to, to be with you today. Uh, and I, I want to share some things that, 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 God, has, that God has showed me uh, for, for today specifically. Oh, I'm supposed to do this thing. Okay, what do I, um, right or left? Let's get spiritual. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Good, 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 good. Um, this is going to serve to confirm when we, when we are in those times where they're being led by the Spirit, you could see the vein of ministry that has happened even through last night, even into this morning. How many of you recognize that? Okay. It's a, it's a similar theme. It's a similar vein. That means God with people that at least I barely know, God is saying the same message throughout and so there's something that we need to pay attention, especially if God is going to repeat something. How many of y'all know that? God says something twice in his word. That's something to pay attention to. Three times, it's a, it's a done deal. You, be, you, better, you better make sure that's happening. Um, but as I've been listening to all these wonderful men and women of God, I've just been, I've just been filled up so, so much already. I was writing notes as quickly as I could. Hasn't this been so rich, y'all? Just so good. Um, uh, and, and today, I don't know if it's going to come out, uh, forgive me, I'm a pastor, so I don't know if it's going to come out preachy or teachy, but let's just, uh, if y'all can bear with me, however it comes out, we're going to, we're going to roll with it. Okay. Um, 
I believe what I have to give you today is more of a message than a model. Um, I believe that the most practical that we can be is to be spiritual, is to be spiritual. Let's get spiritual. Ephesians 6, 12, Ephesians 6, 12 says this, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the King James Version. The contemporary English version says it this way. We are not fighting against humans. We are fighting against forces and authorities and against rulers of darkness and powers in the spiritual world. We're not fighting humans. It has to start there. The understanding has to start there. And if I can just add and double down on some of the things that have already been said. The reason why this is so important is because Jesus was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus was made manifest to destroy the work of a spiritual being. It's a spiritual work. What we are involved in, every dimension of ministry that is represented here, recovery, pastoring for the couple of us, is spiritual is spiritual and as basic as that sounds if we don't start there we will put the system before the spiritual you can go all a, any direction that you that you want to with it you can put you can get Ishmael before you can get Isaac you can get the monster before you get the ministry you can get the system before you get the spirit he was made manifest for a spiritual purpose Let's not forget what it means to be born again. Born again of what? The Spirit. Does a man go back into his mama's womb? No. Nicodemus, he doesn't. He's born again in the Spirit. This is a spiritual work. And as, if, we ever, if we ever shift over to the system and the list of do's and don'ts, and we put that first, we will get things out of whack, we'll get things out of order, and we won't treat this thing the way that it needs to be treated. We won't address it from the right place. The whole thing is spiritual. Let's get spiritual. Oh, let's do like we do in church, all right? Can we all do it? Let's get spiritual. See? That's good. The whole thing is faith. It's a spiritual concept. Believing is a spiritual concept. Salvation, it's a spiritual concept, right? Miracles, signs, and wonders, all of this, it, it, it births out of the spiritual these words are what? Spirit and life. We can keep going on and on about proving how much of a spirit work this is. Um, many times in our ministry, and this is true for all of you, you're, you're tempted to choose another way, to try to go another way in your own abilities and in your own talents and in your own gifts. And when you allow yourself to begin to be moved and used by the Holy Spirit, you will find out really fast that your ways are way below his ways. You will find out really fast that you have no power whatsoever to do anyone any good. You have no ability within yourself to make anything happen. It's all through Jesus. I believe it was Brother A that... that that's that said this and 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 even some of the things that God has been teaching me is is has come out of the living free training that he's done with 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 our church and with us but addiction is not a substance issue it's a spiritual issue we all know that it's a spiritual issue it's a spiritual issue we have to begin here if we fail to manifest and allow the holy spirit to manifest through our lives we will manufacture something instead to put it in its place. To put it in its place. Let's get spiritual with it. What we fail to allow God to manifest through us will manufacture a substitute. We'll manufacture a substitute. We cannot manufacture something in the natural that was meant to be spiritual. It's meant to be spiritual. How do we know? A program is wonderful. But a program never saved anyone. Jesus did. A person did. And that person has to come before the program ever does. The person comes before the principles. 
A program offers the practices. A person brings power. That's the Holy Spirit. Remember what Paul said. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of what? Of the Spirit of the Lord and of power. And of power. What made a difference for all of us? Jesus made the difference for all of us. Every single one of us. That's what made the difference. I don't know about you, but growing up in the church isn't what made a difference for me. I have a testimony of what God has done in my life, but I have one of those testimonies that God has been good. I have a wonderful father and mother. My father went to be with the Lord. I was 25 years old. Um, Another reason why Teen Challenge is so near and dear to my heart is because how much he loved Teen Challenge, and he would he is he is watching right now and just glowing over the fact that we're we're this connected with with this wonderful ministry. Um, but growing up in church isn't what changed me. It laid it laid a lot of foundation and it brought me back to what I needed to do and who I needed to meet. But it was my encounter with Jesus that made all the difference. It always is. The principles and the programs will not have any power if Jesus isn't the Alpha and the Omega. Well, whatever, whatever dimension you're in charge of, whatever degree of, whether you're a director, whether you're a staff member, all of those things, unless, unless the power of the Spirit and Jesus is at the center, the, the beginning and the end, we will default to a set of systems that fall far inferior to the power of God. Okay, um, just laying some foundation here as we, as we, as we go forward. Um, here's the here here's here's the next part because uh, I was talking with John uh, about the role of the church in, in the addiction, and this is the the phrase that that God gave me, and that is this: creating a culture of freedom. Creating a culture of freedom. Speaking of, let's get spiritual. Word of God says this, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. True freedom. Real freedom does not out happen outside of God. True freedom. And if you ask anyone who has walked this path, has walked through addiction, how important is freedom? Freedom is everything. Freedom is absolutely everything. The waking up begins when you get to the point of saying, I'll do whatever it takes to be free, to get free, to know what it's like to have freedom, to know what it's like to live a life where I'm not looking over my shoulder wondering what's catching up with me. Oh my goodness. How important is freedom? It's everything, and Jesus knows that. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Come on, let's go to the Word. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. In other words, for the sake of freedom itself, Jesus made us free. That's how important freedom is. That's why we're so, we so fully support and partner with ATC, because of the model of freedom that is Jesus Christ, a spiritual model. The model is the message. Uh, as, you were, as you were speaking and preaching, Brother A, I was looking at all these things, addict, uh, an, an addict this, 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 and this, and I said, you know what could go in that addict spot? People. Addicts live in denial. People live in denial. It's what you were saying. It's what you were talking about. And this is how it even ties into what the Lord had for me. That's why, that's why I'm sharing it. Just to confirm here in the group that God is speaking something to us if we'll take it home with us. Okay, that he's speaking something important. That everyone is in the same boat. Everyone, all of us are in the same boat. And it's only Jesus that calls us out 
of the boat and onto the water. All of us are in the same boat. Speaking of spiritual, walking on water is not logical. There's nothing logical about walking on water. <laughs> it's a complete supernatural experience. But the freedom that Jesus has for us is the answer. Everyone in the same boat having the same type of struggle, whether it's behavioral, whether it's substance, doesn't matter what label is on it. The truth is, is that every single one of us know what it's like to live dependent on something else other than Jesus. Every single person on the face of the planet dependent on something else that we are hoping that we're hoping will give us life that will hope that we're hoping to give us some kind of answer that falls short in fact it sounds like this all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god every single one of us it's sin and we can label it however that we want to but what man has never, has never been addicted to sin, has never been addicted to pleasure, never addicted to satisfying the, the flesh, every single one have. What is true of one is true of all. It's mankind. And although we may be in different degrees and in different stages and in different places, we're all in the same boat until Jesus shows up. Oh, man. Come on, church. We're all in the same boat till Jesus showed up. The difference is, is that I exchanged my worldly addiction for a supernatural addiction. A worldly dependence to a supernatural dependence upon the Lord. It was the source. So from a church standpoint, we acknowledge everybody needs freedom. Everyone needs freedom. Everyone who walks through the doors of our church needs the freedom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever they're at in their life, we know what it's like to, to, to have to walk through that process. Through the process of, of understanding, through the process of identity, of discovering who you are as a son and daughter of God. But every single person needs some degree of freedom in Jesus Christ. I'll ask you this. Taking nothing away from the level or severity of addiction, but tell me who's worse off. The man possessed by a legion of demons living in tombs in the Gadarenes who with one encounter with Jesus The demons were cast out, and when the town came to see what they had heard had happened, the man was sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully clothed, no longer naked, and in his right mind. One encounter with Jesus. We'll, we'll, we'll pray this at the end, but if there's anything that we take home today, it should be that one word from Jesus changes everything. Changes everything. One touch, one encounter with Jesus changes everything. Absolutely everything. The man sitting at the feet of Jesus. Who, tell me, who was worse off? That man or the rich young ruler who was given the opportunity to follow Jesus, but because he was addicted to his wealth and his comfort and his riches and all of his stuff, refused the offer and the opportunity to go with Jesus? Who's worse off? Where's the real addiction at? Hmm. That man who was caught in the legion of demons, he wasn't even pursuing Jesus. Come on. Jesus said, I'm going to this man. He was making his way across the sea with his disciples. And in the middle of the night, what happened? A wind, a storm kicked up trying to keep him from getting to his place. But Jesus said, we're going to the other side. So guys, don't worry. We're going to get there. Calm the storm. Calm the wind. And met this man and delivered him in a moment. Come on, what we do and who we serve is 100% supernatural. And the temptation in the middle of our ministry will always be to default to some kind of system and to trust in something other than the supernatural power of God. To trust in something else. 
when one touch from Jesus changes it all. Creating a culture of freedom. And I, and I, I don't have this here. I just have the titles up here. But if some things that you want to write down, uh, here's one for you. Creating a culture of freedom. For where you're at, your ministry, your part in ministry, it begins with acknowledging that this is a universal need. This is a universal need. And that true freedom only manifests by the power of the Lord. True freedom is only in the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. The role in the ministry of the church is to be a community with a culture of freedom that comes as a byproduct of the activity of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Creating a culture of freedom. And let me say this too for all of these who are on staff. I knew what it was like to be a staff pastor and you're serving under incredible ministry leaders. You're serving, you're ser serving under mighty men and women of God. This is just as important for you to carry this same heart with you in the place that you serve. You will not do any better for the men and women that you serve who have authority over you in these great ministries, you will not do any better for them than carrying the heart of believing for the supernatural. Believing for something spiritual and something phenomenal to happen. Because wouldn't it be great to believe that, that men and women, they step on campus and before they can even get through the door, they're on their knees weeping because of the power of the Holy Spirit. They come under the power of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be even better then a, then a year later, then a year later, things beginning to transpire. I don't care how he does it. All I know is that there has to be something that is supernatural and spiritual about it. Amen. Here's the next thing. Creating a culture of freedom. This is where it's going to begin. Self-culture. Self-culture. If there's anything that we learned in the church world over the last two years is, that, is this. We are the church. So no matter what recovery area you're, you're serving in, we are the church, every single one of us in this room. We are the church, you and I. Together we are the body of Christ. Every joint supplies, and when there's one out of joint, the whole body feels it. The church is you and I. The micro culture is the self culture. Our self culture is influencing the greater community culture, okay? This is why self-culture is so important. It's because uh, Pastor Greg Groeschel says it, says it this way. The hardest person to lead is yourself. The hardest person that we lead is us. It's us. And there's such a challenge to that. Our self-culture, you can't hope to influence or establish a culture of freedom that is first not happening in us. Okay? So if the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of freedom takes hold of us, then the culture around us will immediately begin to, to change. I believe that. It happened. It happened in the, in the book of Acts. It happened throughout the entire New Testament church, which, by the way, we are still the New Testament church. Come on, somebody. We are the New Testament church of today. We are the disciples of today. The spirit of the Lord is God in the earth in this day. If we had been in the time of Jesus, we'd have been walking with Jesus. If we'd have been time in the Old Testament, we'd have been walking with the prophets and with the kings. But no, we are in the day and the age of the Holy Spirit until Jesus comes back for his church. Now we're just getting into the we're just getting into the word we're having church. But that's how significant it is for us to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit for the work of the ministry. <laughs> for culture, it works a little bit differently as believers. Culture is less about what we make and it's more about what we seek. The kingdom culture is something we seek. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Jesus himself, he was freedom in the flesh. He was freedom in the flesh. 
his self-culture transformed the culture of humanity. What I love is that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we become that vessel. Okay? For better or for worse, we are the microculture that we're experiencing. You can't hide a culture of freedom. It's not meant to be hidden. Take a light, put it under a bushel. That's not the way it goes, right? It's put up on a stand. It has to be visible. It has to be communicated. The reason why self-culture is so important is because the greatest asset to your church, your organization, your team is you. Is the person that God put in that place for such a time as this. It's you. It's you and I. You are meant to be a bearer of freedom. For those who come in contact with you. Your self-culture, how you are managing and how you are growing. I love what Brother A said. I love this, practicing his presence. How you're growing and developing in that is creating a subculture around you, the people that you're connected with, the people that you minister to, the people that we come in contact with. All of that is being affected. So self-culture is what leads us into the community culture. It's a quote. It's a pretty famous quote. Don't know who said it, but before you start to try to change the world, start, start here. Start this thing here. It's, it, it's got to be here. It's very religious to say this is what the church needs to do, and this is what people need to do, and this is what we need to do, and this is what they need to do, and this is what the culture needs to do. All that is nice, and it sounds pretty, but the truth of it is it has to be here. If we don't get the self thing, then we'll go away from today, and we'll have taken some notes. But if we don't get the self thing is the key. And whether or not anybody else follows, I'm going to be a bearer of freedom in Jesus' name. The Lord has set me free. I want that to rub off on somebody. I want that to be the thing that rubs off. That there is true freedom. That there's real freedom. Oh, I don't want to get ahead of myself because there's a, there's, there's, there's a great analogy we're going to use and a great story we're going to use. But what are the elements that we need in a culture where freedom is the norm? What are the elements we need in a culture where freedom is the norm. Oh. Three things. Ready? You can write them down. The elements needed in a culture where freedom is the norm. Freedom is the norm. Freedom is the norm. Freedom is the norm. Some of y'all need to pray that over your, over your ministries. Freedom is the norm. But the three things, spirit, truth, love. Nothing but the good old gospel of Jesus Christ. We said it already, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. There's only one real kind of freedom, an eternal freedom that comes by the power of God, the eternal freedom that comes through Jesus Christ. So it's spirit. It's truth. Secondly, it's truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you We started changing when we got honest with ourselves, when we got real with us. Uh, third is love. Spirit, truth, love. <laughs> love covers the multitude of sins. Perfect love casts out all fear. It's all about the love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love hopes all things, endures all things. Love. You can have faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. How important is so, so much is love? That you can talk in the tongues of men and of angels, be able to do all of this. But if you have not love, you're just making noise. We're just making noise. We're just making noise. Those are keys to why this wonderful couple has also had the longevity in ministry that they've had. Spirit, truth, and love. And love. Because when these things keep happening and the turnover happens and what you hoped to happen doesn't in somebody's life, man, we keep our love on. We keep our love on. Mm. Jesus is love. And, 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 and let, me, um, 
let me just put a, a, a pin right here because I want to address in, in some of this is, as John and I were talking about some of the restoration factors um, uh, and about helping and helping leaders uh, and, and our staffs uh, and those of you who are on, on staff, um, a really communication is so vital, so important. Every relationship is built on communication. Come on marriages, come on husbands and wives, it's built on communication. You can never assume that the people that you lead are okay. You can never assume that the people that you're leading are okay, or the people that you're connected with. I found out that if you don't ask, they generally don't tell. For some people, it takes what? Getting, getting caught for things to start to turn around and, and being caught is the best thing that could have happened. But for many, they're, just, they're, they're secretly hiding their, their addiction and their dependencies and they're trying to cover it up, right? Um, and so there has to be someone who is leading the way in that place of vulnerability and asking the questions to not assume that they're just that they're just all right we've implemented in our in our staff um the hard questions okay if we're not asking if we're not asking the hard questions then are we really being truthful with each other and are we really loving each other right so we have to we have to, in order to create a culture a community culture that where freedom is the norm then we have to talk about the things that keep us from freedom we have to address those things. We have to be willing to open up to those things. And as a leader and all the leaders in this room, the number one priority for us is to lead the way in that vulnerability and that openness. How fair is it for me to ask for someone to bear their soul about what's going on in their life or things that they may be struggling with if I'm not willing to lead the way in it, to lead the way in it. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 50 through 53. I'm just going to read that portion of it because there's a whole other, there's a whole other, uh, uh, the rest of the passage is about the story of David and Goliath and and there's so much to take from it, but uh, 1 Samuel 17, starting with verse 50, it says this, So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling and the stone. He struck the Philistine and killed him, and there was no sword for David in his hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and finished him. I like that. And finished him and cut off his head with his own sword. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they ran. Bunch of punks. <laughs> yeah, see, see, I have fun with this stuff. I like the I like the picture of David out there. Who do you think you are? Yeah, okay. My my wife is like like this, all right? So hopefully the kids will get the height gene in the family, all right? But she's like half my size almost, right? But if you can imagine, here's here's David, this ruddy little dude standing up against Goliath and shouting to him, "Who do you think you are?" How dare you defy the armies of the living God? And you know what's going to happen today? Today, I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field, and I will remove your head from you, son. Oh, come on, a culture of freedom. Getting loose. Cut off his head. Philistines saw that their champion was dead. They fled. Then the men of Israel and Judah rose up and shouted and pursued the Philistines. Forty days prior to that moment, Goliath showed up every single day and taunted the entire army of Israel and not a man moved. But one man took the lead and his stand and his voice and his influence and his victory 
released an entire army to rise up and to rush the battle line and to pursue the enemy and see it defeated. How important is our self-culture and our freedom? And when we lead the way, it is the license, it is the release for others to follow that path and say, I can do that as well. I can do the same. Forgive me if I'm preaching it a little bit. Can we just, do, can we just have church in here? I'm just a pastor. Oh, man. We have to lead the way. It gives permission for others to believe in the God that David believed in. When, uh, when, when I was growing up, and I, gave, uh, I alluded to this a little bit, but when I was growing up, grew up in a wonderful home, uh, I was not a PK. John, I was a, uh, I guess it was a DK. My dad was a deacon, but he was a, um, he was a, he was a, he was a, a business owner. He and my mom, and they, he was an aircraft mechanic who uh, started a, a business, and uh, God blessed it, and uh, we were a blessed family. And I, I uh, uh, grew up in a, in a wonderful church, an Assembly of God church that was was spirit filled, and I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for the the Holy Spirit and the freedom of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, and uh, so many wonderful things happened during that during that time in in my life. But I will tell you this: that um, the generation that I come from and that Jonathan and I come from is called Generation X, and and God. He's probably showed it to many others, but it's just been a, a revelation pretty recent to me. And um, I believe a lot in names and that names have significance. And that, that generation X, you see, because, because my generation, we were developing as, as young people when the internet came into every home in America. It was called America Online. And so the generation that I was in, we were, we were young men and we were young, young women. And how many of y'all know what comes with the territory when you're young and you're, you're developing? I believe what the enemy had in mind was for Generation X to be an X-rated generation. And he brought in... He brought in this tool and this instrument. You see, because before that, I do remember, I didn't live a whole lot of life, but I do remember a life long enough that if you wanted that sort of thing, you had to go to a place specifically to get it. I know it may shift and have some uncomfortable shifts in here, but this is a David moment. You see, because the church has no problem talking about pot. But they have a lot of trouble talking about pornography. And the thing that I deal with most as a pastor, with churches, with staff, with people who are serving on our teams, and with people who are coming in and out every single week, is not what they're getting on the street. It's what they're getting on the screen. It is, it is literally touching every aspect of our lives here in America, and, and, and it's absolutely devastating. And it go to, to your point, because it was in my notes also, if you were to compare the, the, the brain of, of, a, of a, a dope addict to one of a, of a pornography addict, identical. Identical. Why? Because it's releasing the same chemical compounds. It's the same release of dopamine. What is that telling us? Is that it's all a source other than Jesus Christ. It's all a dependency on something, whether it's a behavior, whether it's a substance, but it's releasing the same chemical reaction. Your body is experiencing the same thing, the same euphoria, the same, the same feeling of instant gratification, all of those things. Can I talk about this in the middle of this thing? Well, a couple of people are okay with it. Cool. But 
Believe me, the last thing that I wanted to do was, was be, in all honesty, was to be a David to our church and to tell them the stories, the account of how Jesus set me free. Because I didn't want to be that guy. The enemy. You don't, you don't. It's, it's okay. You don't have to throw yourself under the bus. I'll throw myself under the bus for all y'all. I live under the bus. And it's okay because Jesus lives there with me. He lives there with me, under the bus, under the feet of men. He lives uh, by the cross. You understand? He was, he was completely ostracized, completely rejected. It's okay. When you find a place of freedom, you know what happens when you tell your story and you live the self-culture and you make yourself vulnerable and you be the leader? You know what happens? You experience more freedom, not less. And the lie is... The lie is, is that you're going you're gonna to ruin everything. You're going to ruin your reputation. You're going to ruin what people think of you. Oh, my goodness, Jonathan Lindbergh is not going to have you back if you talk about that. But what if we knew what it was like to be really free? This stuff is a vice. It is, it, is, it is destructive. It is so destructive. It is so destructive. That's why I said earlier, growing up in the church isn't what made the difference because growing up in the church didn't keep me from doing things even though I knew they were wrong to do. Okay? That doesn't excuse me from making the wrong decisions that I made. But what I do have is the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ that met me when I was ready to say, this is, this is done. This is no longer fitting for my life. This has caused nothing but pain. This has caused nothing but... You, you talk about your self-worth plummeting? Oh my goodness. I believe, I believe a lot of the, the, the judgment that is happening, happening in the earth and that, that is that is potentially happening in America has to do, can I, just, can I just preach this, can I say this, has to do with how much of there has been a worship at that altar, at that altar. And I, and I, know, this is not, I know this is not comfortable, but, but, but bear with me just a few more minutes. John, are we okay? Just to... One man chose to trust in the Lord and not to cower in fear and stand up in the middle of the field when everybody else was watching and to go after the enemy and say, this is, the, this is, this, how dare you defy the armies of the living God? Isn't this the picture of where we're at? There's so many people that are standing in fear and they're just waiting for a David to get up and say, listen, we're going to stand with the Lord. David wasn't perfect, but he trusted in God. He trusted in God. I need to give you a few other things, and I know we need to move quickly. But I want to give you this. Oh, oh, oh. Let's see. The right order. The right order. To bring freedom into your leaders and to your people that you serve, you have to lead the way in vulnerability and truth. Someone has to be the catalyst. Listen, the disciples didn't know how to pray until Jesus showed them how to pray. The disciples didn't know how to heal until Jesus showed them it was possible. The disciples didn't know how to cast out demons until they saw Jesus doing it. They didn't know how to forgive until they saw Jesus doing it. I want to give you one other passage because I want to make sure that you have this order. And, and uh, uh, once I read this passage, I'll give you a few other things before we hand it off. John 8, 1 through 11. Uh, John made mention of it earlier. This is one of my favorite accounts in all of Scripture. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple area, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began teaching them. Now the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery. And after placing her in the center of the courtyard, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, 
It commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? Now they were saying this to test him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. How evil is that, that they were using this woman to try to trap Jesus? It wasn't even about the woman. He stooped down, wrote his, wrote, took his finger and wrote on the ground. We don't know what he wrote. There are many ideas of what he wrote, but we're not getting into that today. Verse 7, when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. <laughs> Love it. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, when they heard this, they began leaving one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone with the woman where she was in the center of the courtyard. Verse 9, again, when they heard this, they began leaving one by one, beginning with the older ones. Saints and elders in this room, lead the way. Lead the way. Be the first ones to be vulnerable and share the story. The older ones left first. They connected it first. So there they were, alone, this woman caught in the act. Can you imagine? It also makes me mad that the man wasn't, wasn't there. Again, a whole other message. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, they're by themselves. Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I don't condemn you either. Go from now on and sin no more. We can't even begin to wrap our heads around the love of Jesus. We can't even begin to comprehend just how good and how amazing he is. And I believe there's more freedom that he has for even people in this room. You can't even begin to describe his love, his compassion for, for us. So my assignment has been not solely based on the what to do, but it is the who you need. Who you need comes before what you do. And it's proven in this story. Here's the points very quickly. Huh. We can never fix an addiction with a to-do list. It always has to be about meeting a person. It always has to be about meeting Jesus. It's not about something, it's about someone. <laughs> Why we need him. First of all, the fact that she was brought by her accusers is a picture of bondage. She was brought bound by them, the accusers. Jesus didn't begin by addressing her. Come on, y'all. God, God is telling us something. He didn't begin by addressing her, but by addressing all of the destructive voices. He began by addressing. This is, again, this is the picture of the spiritual, right? This is all spiritual. Satan is the accuser of the people of God. So Jesus addresses the accuser, the accusation first. Once he has dealt with the accusation, he removes the condemnation. Deals with the accusation. Removes the condemnation. Look at what he did for this woman. He had every right to judge her, condemn her, and by the law, throw the stone. He had that right. He was perfect, holy, without sin. Yes. But once he dealt with the accusation, he removes the condemnation. My goodness, how much he loves. And that's when the freedom began to happen in Jesus and said to her, no one is condemning you. Neither do I. Freedom. Freedom. We know how it is. People in an addiction lifestyle, they live in a life of, of, of suspicion. Word of God says that the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no one pursues them. She expected to be condemned. She expected to be judged. She expected that even after everybody left, that Jesus was going to rail it. He was going to take her out. That's the way she felt. That's what she expected. You see, but when Jesus comes on the scene, he does something unexpected. It's his love that compelled me to keep coming back. 
It's his love. They kept saying, I love you. I forgive you. It's there. The moment that the, that the confession ex escapes my lips, the forgiveness is there. Praise God. Almost done. Wrapping it. We're expected to be condemned. And Jesus is not what we expected. He doesn't start with what to do. He ended with what to do. He didn't start with what to do. He ended with what to do. Go and sin no more. <laughs> People have a tendency to look at me funny when I say this, but do, you, do we believe we can live a life free of intentional sin? It's called a holy life. The Lord said, be holy for I am holy. And we're like, oh, God, how? How in the world. I'm telling you, some of this you've got to pass on to your team, your staff, and to those who come through the door. It is absolutely possible for us to live a holy life free from intentional sin. Yeah, come on. I said, it, I said amen a lot of times before I fully believed it. Okay? But let me prove it to you. Can I prove it to you? That there. There are absolutely no voices that cannot be conquered by Jesus. There is absolutely, there's absolutely no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Here's my question. Why would Jesus go through all of that trouble, silence the voice of the critics and the accusers, not condemn her, and then have the gall to tell her to do something that she wouldn't be able to do? Go and sin no more. After I've given you all this freedom, let me put this heap of bondage on you. Go and sin no more. No, 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 no. Jesus gave her an instruction of what to do that she was 100% completely capable of doing now that she was free. 100% possible. The truth is that we can go and sin no more. God is not a tease. He's not a liar. He's not a man that he would lie. Come on, if you know the word, then claim it. Declare it. He's not a man that he would lie. <laughs> we can be free and stay free. I'm going to hand this over, over to Jonathan, and, and thank you, man. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm wrapping it up here. But the right order, according to Jesus, is that introduction to him addresses the accusations, cast out condemnation. I know some of you have been writing that down. Forgive it and then live it. I'm going to ask you this, and if, if, if it's okay, John, I'd like to, to, to just pray, closing out this, this session, and that is this. Is, is what are you believing to happen through you and in your ministry? What are you really believing and hoping to happen? My hope and my heart is that it is, it is a complete and utter dependence upon the Lord to bring radical freedom radical freedom in you and through you that this is that this is that this, this is more than just something that we got into that this is a life this is a calling and that those who are free stand up we who are free begin to stand up and declare that freedom and a holy life is absolutely 100 percent possible that it's not a trick it's not a game that this is reality and jesus made the way for us to be able to do it amen Amen. I'm a pastor. Let me pray for you, all right? Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would seed every single word, seal every single word that has been spoken by every wonderful speaker here, God, by everything that you have spoken by your spirit. Lord, we receive it. Lord, we pray that it would be deposited. The seed of the word of God would be deposited in good soil of our hearts and that we would see it bear fruit, grow and bear fruit and bring forth a great harvest. Lord God, I, just, I, I pray freedom like never before on the lives of every man and woman in this room. Lord, the freedom of the Lord be expressed in their life and their heart, Father, and through their ministry. Lord God, that we would see the best days of every ministry represented here. That we would see the results of the power of God manifest in our lives. Father, I thank you that the things that you have spoken, Lord God, you will continue to work. You're watching over your word to perform it. 
And it will not return unto you void without first prospering into that thing in which it's sent. So, Father, thank you. Every word prosper for your glory and for your testimony and for your fame. Lord God, and, if, and, for, and for anyone else in this room who is longing for that next place of freedom, And that the walk of freedom is still continuing. Father, I thank you that they walk by faith and not by sight. And that freedom is 100% available. Lord God, that you are not withholding any good gift from your children. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.